Uh, next up, we will have the Board of Revision and Taxes. Good morning. Good morning, Council President and members of Council. My name is Carla Pagan. I'm here this morning to testify on behalf of the fiscal 2020 year budget for the Board of Revision of Taxes. The BRT general fund appropriations from FY19 to FY20 remains consistent. Um, our, actually, our spending will go down 13000 for fiscal year 2020. Market value appeals for tax year 2018 resulted in the highest taxable dollars appealed in more than a decade. The board had a successful 2018 completing 100% of the timely filed appeal value, filing volume within the calendar year. Um, currently, tax year 2019 appeal season is underway. It's another busy year. We have 9,700 assessment appeals. 75% of those appeals are for residential properties and another 25% for commercial and industrial properties. To date, just under 4,200 appeal decisions have been rendered with board decisions, with board resolving approximately 250 appeals per week. Um, and that's our summary in a nutshell, and I'll open the floor to questions. All right. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, man, I'm loving this testimony. Sure. Great. Short and sweet. Straight and to the <laughs> point. And you guys are so eager to answer questions. That's how I think everybody's that's shortening right. their testimony. <laughs> um, and again, thank you. Thank you for being here. There's um, been a number of questions about the timing. Uh, actually goes back, I guess, when we actually separated via charter change the two entities. So can you tell me what happens to a citizen who is still waiting for a first level review? Because we understand in some instances that time has lagged behind. I think uh, OPA has actually indicated that's the case. And the deadline for the BRT um, passes and a person may not necessarily agree with the first level of review uh, response. What happens? How does that person have a recourse in terms of what their direction should be? Well, since the start of the OPA first level review process in 2014, we offered those citizens that appeal that have a pending FLR courtesy, we allow them to file 30 days from the date of that decision letter, even if it's after our formal appeal filing deadline. And that worked well for a couple years. Um, within the past two years, now with a huge amount of OPA FLRs being filed and sometimes some answers take a long time to get back to taxpayers, we found that now we're getting thousands of appeals in after our deadline and it's hampering our workflow. So beginning in this, um, in 2019, we're going to send a mailing um, in the summer to anyone that has a pending FLR, give them one of our appeal forms, and let them know that our filing deadline is still October 7th. So we're going to reach out to those people that have pending FLR deadlines. Regardless of the, your traditional timeline as it relates to the deadline, because I know that there's, I think we asked this question, we talked about this earlier when you were testifying, uh, this whole overlap issue. Um, I actually want to ask you a question, but it wouldn't be fair with respects to the decision to separate the two entities. That's probably not a good question for you since we in council did that, but and that, that wouldn't be fair to you. Uh, that's probably below your pay grade. It was and a great you, idea. And you notice I say below your pay grade because the, the politicians did it, you know, wasn't the, the folks that actually do the work. Um, in your, in your budget detail, you state that the, you did, and you just wrote, the 8,877 8, appeals were filed in 18. Um, in our analysis, uh, when we did our audit, uh, we had indicated that our ability to um, deal with the anticipated um, appeals uh, based on the challenges in the OPA. Um, we had actually recommended that we ramp up the resources, i.e. maybe hire additional people to deal with all of the appeals when you're in. Um, if, in fact, you wanted to be able to do that in a timely way, uh, not having to have this extension of this deadline uh, for some time, and again, you may not be able to answer this question, 
No. We, if we needed to add some additional people to have done with that, because I, I'm, we still in the midst of trying to figure this whole OPA thing out. Uh, can you talk about resources at the BRT, given the Sure. Ant so every appeal filing year, depending on our volume, we have a group of temp staff that we may call on. Um, and even Rob Dubo calls me once a year to say, hey, Carl, if you need more money getting the appeals done, there's money available to you. So we've been working with Tim's staff for so long now, there's a pool of people almost every fall that we can call on um, for additional help, depending whether we have 2,000 appeals or 20,000 appeals. Mm -hmm. So that helps the processing time. Um, what it doesn't speed up at all is that, you know, board hearings are just like these hearings. If 10,000 people want to come before a board and vent for a minute, you can only speed those hearings up but so fast. So it helps the processing time and we will split board panels to hear twice the amount of appeals in a hearing day. Um, but you can only go as quick as possible. But resource wise, we're comfortable. We've never been denied and we've asked for additional funding. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, in for the FY19 assessments, you had an average increase of 11 percent, obviously leading to a large increase in appeals. And I know in some areas we have this this particular um, uh, fiscal year, there's going to be an additional uh, percentage of increases um, based on assessments. Um, can you talk about the percentage of appeals that are, for the 19 are still being processed on your side? And, and what, are, what are basically, what can your office do to ensure the timely conclusion of the FY19 appeals? And last but not least, how many of the appeals to the BRT were owners of abated homes challenging the land values? Because as you know, we changed the nature of the land value uh, percentages versus the improved i.e. building, and I know a lot of people were complaining as a result yeah. of that. But, so. so going back to your first question, um, so our appeal filing deadline's in October, and we spend usually October through November receiving those appeals, filing them, sharing with, the, with them to the OPA, and then our hearing calendar for 2019 appeals begins in January of 2019. Mm -hmm. And it takes us about a calendar year to hear all of that appeal, appeal filing volume. So our goal again for tax year 2019 is to be complete of, of 2019 appeals by December 31st. Um, right now we're on target. We're 40% through our appeal filing volume. Um, so we'll be right on target for June, um, hitting 50% of the volume by the middle of the year. Um, I'm trying to think. So your question regarding the abatement appeals. Yeah. The, a lot of folks, you know, we changed the percentage yeah. of the values um, from land versus improvement, i.e. building. And a lot of folks were stunned that they had to now pay a tax bill that was much higher because a lot of, from the perspective of the city, a lot of the land values were underestimated and undervalued. Yes. So... So in the last two years, we've seen less of those. I'm trying to recall, I think it was tax year 2017 that the OPA did a project specifically on land. Mm -hmm. And that year we heard thousands of appeals on uh, land value, especially abated land value. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of those appeals actually were denied because even though their land value may have tripled, the overall total market value was still below their last purchase price. So most of those cases, um, those appeal cases were denied. It was a okay. few exceptions here oh, and there, but okay. yeah. Most right. of those homeowners didn't find relief. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Sure. Um, Chair Reknaz, this is Councilman Don. <clears throat> thank you, Council President. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question from a constituent, actually. Then I'll get to my questions. But how does the BRT address homeowners who appealed in 2018, got their taxes reduced, then just got a big jump in 2019 for 2020 taxes back to the basically the value they successfully appealed a year ago. Yeah, um, that's frustrating. So the OPA just certified 2020 numbers on March 31st. 
So those 2020 notices hit people's mailboxes last month. For all of our board decisions that occurred April 1st or later for 2019 appeals, if their 2020 value changed also, we're rolling that board decision into two years. Um, there's a couple cases where we have not done that. If, um, one, if a homeowner objects, or if there's a big change in the building, like a commercial building layout or structure. But in most of those cases, we're carrying that value over to tax year 2020. And then the homeowner doesn't have to refile again, you know, in three months. Let me ask you another question. Thank you. Sure. Let me ask you another question. The value of real estate determined, I guess, by OPA in the city of Philadelphia, is that about $170 billion? Right. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And if I'm looking at this correctly, we build, we build in, uh, or we collected or build, I guess build in 19, 1.608 billion. Mm -hmm. And the projection for 20 is 1.671 billion. And is it correct that in the last six years or so, our billings have gone from just about a billion to a billion 671? That's more of an OPA question. Um, but those numbers you're reading are accurate. I see them on the reports as well. I believe, though, that's the total market value of real estate in Philadelphia, not the total taxable value. Right. Right. It's because you have eds and meds in there that don't pay Those exempt, taxes. yes, properties. And if you do that formula, uh, if you're looking at the valuation of $1.770 billion, and you multiply that figure times the 0.014, uh, you come out of somewhere in the 230 to 240 billion of taxes that should be collected, and we're building about 1.6, so we're maybe 25 to 30 percent are in the Eds and Meds category. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the other question I have is, um, when you do a first level uh, review or appeal, is that done over the phone or is that done in person? So those are done by the Office of Property Assessment, and. Usually neither. Um, most of those answers are mailed right to the OPA mailing center. The OPA will review what the taxpayer sent in and then issue a decision in writing. Um, a lot of those late FLR decisions or later decisions come because those are the instances when the OPA is engaged with the property owner or maybe they are um, requesting an inspection. But most of those are answered by mail only, no phone call. Would it make any sense, I don't know if it's allowable or not, after you do the mail, if the taxpayer was still unhappy, to be able to have, you know, somebody they could call to at least share their opinion with before we schedule this hearing? Yes, um, and a lot of times they do. But typically the OPA evaluator, I'm sure they're overwhelmed still going through their FLR application. So in most instances they say, oh, if you're still unhappy, then file your BRT appeal. But from a constituent service <clears throat> point of view, Mm -hmm. If I filed the first level re review and it came back in an email that I wasn't happy with, at least if I could have a conversation with somebody and I could hear their side of the story, it might avoid that next step or maybe the reviewer would see the taxpayer's side of the coin. That may happen occasionally. It's more likely they'll say file your BRT appeal and then before that appeal is scheduled for a hearing, then that conversation will happen by email or by phone. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman. Chair, recognize Councilwoman Gim. Thank you very much, Council President. Um, good, good morning. morning. Uh, let's see. You've um, indicated that about 43% of FY19 appeal decisions have been rendered. Is that correct? Correct. And when were those appeals, when were those statements issued out to taxpayers? The decision letters? Yeah. So the timing of this when would they have received that letter in order to make to have done that appeal would have that been in the fall of 2018 or yes, would it so been the, in the spring of 2019 the fall of 2019 20, so our appeal 18 excuse me so our appeal right. filing deadline was october of last year right um and then our hearings for 2019 appeals begin in january and we'll go through the entire calendar year for 2019 okay and so your goal is 50% by June 30th? Correct. And when do you think you, you will have a 100% completion? So that goal is by December 31st of this year. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we're right on target, there's a few divisions in the city mm -hmm. um, that had almost double the appeal filing values, volume as other parts of the city. So those um, particular groups may, or areas may have hearings in January of 2020. Mm -hmm. And what's the current schedule for when hearings are done? How many days a week? So right now there's four days a week the board has, or, excuse me, three days a week that they have oral hearings and one day a week that they do non-oral board decisions. And then one prep day for the following week. Okay. And then I think when we spoke a while ago, at one point it was down to two days, but now we're at three days. Is that right? Yeah, we, I, we haven't had hearings in two days since 2013 probably okay and you find it impossible so one day a week is for prep and then one day a week is for what is the other non-hearing day set aside for so we have non-oral or administrative hearing dates and and during that time period the board will make decisions for those appeals where the homeowner said hey i didn't want to come in for a hearing please review my petition um, and they'll read their petitions and then render a decision. And you think it's difficult to go to four days a week to do hearings because it sounds like the, the two days are very similar for prep and administrative. It probably is. Um, it depends on what type of appeal filing volume that we have. Um, when it's a heavy commercial year where you have thousands of appraisals being submitted and they need a lot of review, you definitely need that prep day. And then even every year we have thousands of non-oral um, appeals filed, so you still need that administrative day. When the board has had appeal years where the vo filing volume has been over 10,000 units, it seems most efficient that we split the board into two different quorums and right. then hold double sessions mm -hmm. on one day rather than add another day per week. Right. And mm -hmm. so currently do you require the whole board to convene as a group or are you doing the splitting up? Because we had heard in previous years when we had a, you know, when there's a spike, uh, usually the board will split. But what is your current practice right now? So right now it's the full board um, during our oral hearings, three days a week. Mm -hmm. Yes. And has there been discussion about whether to split into quorums? It has. We actually have three vacancies. So on the BRT? on the board, yeah. So in two weeks. The Board of Judges will have an election. Um, we had a lot of applicants. When we get back to a full seven-member panel, that split may be optional. Right now, we only have five board members. Um, mm -hmm. So we can't even, uh, four members make a quorum, so we can't even split right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think we've felt very strongly, uh, one of the, one of the m more urgent things is for a rapid resolution. And, of course, as you know, not only do city finances depend on, upon it, but school district finances, more importantly, have depended on it. Um, and while I think there's a reasonable window of time for six months and a certain number, um, if there's a spike up, if there's a way for us to move towards quorum, and if you think that the city council needs to pay attention to the fact, I mean, I don't think we control appointments to the BRT, um, but, you know, I would certainly put in that we need to have a full board, um, especially now. Uh, it should be fully stocked and staffed. <laughs> and we should be Senior. moving to a quorum format so that we can move these procedures through. Um, we will be, you know, it is, for me, a bit of a concern to be a year behind. I, I think, you know, six months is reasonable, somewhere around there. But once you start to drag beyond six months, it starts to raise concerns about whether we have accurate projections, what the impact is for the following year. It impacts planning. Um, so if there's a way that, you know, you think we can be supportive around that, we certainly will. But I would certainly urge the board to, um, uh, you know, get to full, absolutely full capacity. And then if you can consider quorums, I know that that's been brought up before by other sure. BRT commission members. Absolutely. So, and um, just so council is aware, this, the assessment calendar is very different than the fiscal calendar and even so in spring we're getting 2020 notices property owners are getting 2020 notices in the fall their appeal is due to us so then our hearings begin in January of 2020 for a tax bill that would be due in three months um, so absent so we're not behind but absolutely we could split the board so then 
you're hearing more appeals between January and June of any calendar year. Right. Exactly. No, that helps. I mean, obviously, as you know, council passed a bill to freeze assessments at the previous year. So um, we made that on the basis of understanding that we would have rapid resolution because that makes that makes sense. But if we are dragging for a year beyond, then we start to have concerns about whether that is a, a good avenue for us. Um, but it's necessary because a lot of it, as you know, a lot of judgments go through you. There's compromises that are made, adjustments that are made. So we certainly don't want to penalize residents, but we also have to just balance it out. So I appreciate Absolutely. your openness to the quorum aspect of it. Sure. Um, and, you know, I thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, so the, uh, um, let's see, one other question. Um, so I know that Council Member Squilla's legislation uh, did not help, this was the one that freezes the assessments, does not, was, is basically not effective uh, for those whose mortgage lenders pay their bills early in 2019, oh. so if the mortgage lender prepays. Um, is there yeah. any way that in the future if there's a similar piece of legislation that freezes assessments for those who are appealing, um, do we s then send new bills out based on, uh, new bills to those appealing based on the prior year's assessment? Is that what we're doing? So it didn't freeze assessments. Um, it, or, right, I apologize. It allowed them to pay their tax That's bill right. on their previous year's amount Correct. until their appeal was resolved. Um, that's a great ordinance. Property owners love it. The one issue that happened this year is that it came, the timing of it, it was after council came back in right. session. Um, if it ever stops and then restarts again, it would have to start before council goes on session in June. So then the timing of the tax billing and notification of mortgage companies could happen um, effectively. Okay. So do you recommend changes to, if we were to do something similar in the future? I think the way it's running now, I think it's a great system. Property owners are happy. Um, Mortgage, mortgage companies are familiar now and understand it. So I think it's a great idea for the property owners. Now, what it might do to the city's budget, maybe someone else would answer differently, but property owners are very pleased, absolutely. Um, is it possible just to ask uh, city finance to weigh in on that Here. question at all? They're, they'll be coming up for oh, uh, in next, so. Maybe okay. yeah. for clarity. And yeah. I'll ask that question then. Okay. Okay. Bye. All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you for your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for work, work you do. My pleasure. Have and a good afternoon. Rolling right into that, revenue tax bills. Mr. DeBow, I know you're always anxious to come before us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's still good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please identify yourself and proceed, please. Thanks. I'm Rob Dubo, Director of Finance. I'm here to testify in support of Bill 190155. I'm joined at the table by Frank Breslin, the Revenue Commissioner, and Anna Adams, the Budget Director. The bill reduces rates for the wage tax um, from the current 3.8809 for residents and that includes the PICA portion and 3.4567 for non-residents to 3.8712 and 3.4481. We remain committed to gradual reductions in the wage tax as numerous studies and reports consistently cited the city's relatively high wage tax rates as a barrier for job creation. Over the course of our proposed five-year plan, the wage tax rates um, have a reached combined, will reach a combined rate of 3.8327 and 3.4137. It'll be about a 20% reduction from the rate since the late 1990s. That concludes my testimony, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, you state that the five-year plan has wage tax reductions, which we're aware of, and since the resident rate only decreases from 3.88% in FY19 to 3.83% in 24, which 
we understand is one one hundredth of a percent annually. Um, how much of these tax reductions cost the city over the five-year plan? And have you looked at how much, uh, like why to continue it if it's so small? Or is it just to say you're lowering the wage tax, right. I guess, is the question. So it's about $135 million over the five-year plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason to keep reducing it, I mean, if you look at kind of at our rates, they are high. They're kind of spooky for anyone who wants to come here. So trying mm -hmm. to reduce them over time is really important. And even if the reduction in a single year isn't really large, um, it's part of a kind of continued commitment. And over the years, those incremental reductions have added up to something major. You know, and that's why we kind of noticed that we mentioned the 20% reduction. We started this at 4.96%. So we've come down over a full percent. So over time, the reduction has really been significant. No, I got you. And, and we do hear about the, the wage tax from a lot of people and the studies. I, I get that. But there's also, I guess, other taxes or factors that come in here, the net income tax. And uh, yeah, you hear so a lot about that. And also, the uh, going back to the last uh, issue, the unpredictable tax assessments that kind of come in every year. So, the, so how, much, how much do you see that in effect? And I guess in a general question, um, what's the administration's strategy in moving forward? Yeah. So and yeah. the, what studies have consistently shown is that the wage tax and the business tax, as you mentioned, are, mm -hmm. are really two big obstacles. And the five-year plan, the $135 million I talked about was wage and business taxes together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to reduce them both, and the plan does both of those, you know, it's kind of continuing to send that signal that we're committed to, to reducing those taxes. Mm -hmm. And it's always a balancing act between, sure. you know, how much you want to commit to wage tax reductions, how much you want to commit to, you know, the various initiatives that we have in our five-year plan, for things like the Resilience Project, um, yeah, gun we violence. We ask for a few ourselves, I know that. Yeah, right. right. So, you know, it's, it's all a matter of kind of trading everything off. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning. Morning. Um, I just have a few comments on this, and I'm, uh, it has to do with the wage tax. I just want to give you some, and you probably know this history on the wage tax, but just for the public's benefit. It started in December 13, 1939. That was before my time. You were, yeah. <laughs> You weren't behind that, were you? <laughs> it started out at 1.5 percent, and then uh, and then from the 19th, it kept going up. And as people left the city, with the administrations back then, kept raising the tax. And from 1960s to 1990s, 300,000 jobs were lost in Philadelphia, and those administrations had to replace revenue. And they kept raising the tax and chasing more people out of the city. Got to a point of 4.96. When then Governor Rendell, I think in, in the mid-1990s, decided on a program to reduce it. I think the first year the average family saved $5, but it was the sim symbolism of it. And now this, with this new legislation, which I'm in favor of, it goes down to 3.8712. But when you look at the statistics and you look at the facts that today 40% of our population commutes to a job in the suburbs, 211,000 people every day go to a job in the suburbs compared to New York, which is 15%. Then when you look at the studies that show from 2010 to 2017, 81% of the people who left Philadelphia did not have children. 19% did, 81% did not. And the number of reason, the reasons why they left, number one, taxes, and number two, job opportunities, which are kind of interrelated. And then when you look at the wealth of the region, clearly the wealth of this region is in the suburbs, not in the city. Our wealthiest zip code is 19106, which is probably like Washington Square Society Hill. Compared to Gwynedd Valley, they have $157,000 average higher income in Gwynedd Valley than we have in our wealthiest zip code in Philadelphia. We have 21 incentives that offset all different types of tax benefits to encourage people to come to the city. I call them band-aids. Whatever they are, they're band-aids. They're, they're not dealing with the big issue. Is there an appetite in the administration to deal with the cure versus the Band-Aid? And the cure that has been documented is number one, dramatically reducing the city wage tax, and two, 
the net income and gross receipts of the birth taxes. Those are the issues that all these band-aids try to deal with. Unless we're going to attack those issues, we're going to keep having these band-aids. And by the way, um, I introduced legislation which this council supported to look at all those 21 incentives, and I know you're working on those reports with Commerce now, and that's good. But really, the real cure is the city wage tax, and when we enact bills that are specific to Philadelphia, we do not help the growth of our city. If it was state of Pennsylvania, no problem. When they're specific to Philadelphia, it can become an issue. So my question is, is the administration willing to look at a dramatic different look at the city wage and the BERT net income and gross receipts, which if we do attack those three, you might not need these other incentives. We're always willing to look at that, and we think reducing wage and business tax rates is really important. We do have to look at all of that in the context of our entire budget and what those reductions mean for our ability to do and you know, the other important things um, in our budget. We are, as you said, um, and you know, we are doing the incentive study to see what that, um, how effective those incentives are. And I do think that you know, it's a really legitimate question, would we be better off with lower rates and fewer or no incentives? Right. Get, basically, could we eliminate the incentives if we lower those taxes? Like, could we see some sort of an economic model that could maybe give us some data? Is that worthwhile? I think that's definitely worth looking at, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Ginn. Thank you very much. Um, I know you had a little bit of this conversation earlier, but I wanted to see if you could also add a little bit more clarity around uh, the plan around sequestration. So part of our plan last year was to achieve uh, that $93 million for school district through the sequestration. Um, but I, uh, I was wondering if you could actually give us what, what is the actual plan moving ahead um, to achieve those numbers. Yep. And I'll, I'll let the Revenue Commissioner talk about the plan going ahead, but that $93 million was never a number that, that came from us, and I, I think we thought that might have been too high. But we'll talk about what we're doing with sequestration and kind of what the pool looks like. I'll, I'll let Frank talk about that. Yeah, we talked a little bit about it before, but um, certainly the the tool of sequestration is a you know is a powerful collection tool for us, um, and we've been using it, and now we're going to begin using it for water delinquencies. The challenge that we've had is the pool of candidates for sequestration. Um, We've been using it for several years now. I've collected over $80 million through sequestration, so it wasn't something new last year. We did want to essentially double down on it last year, and we started doing that by um, putting more resources behind it. That was very effective, but we reached the point of uh, our average collection went from around $6,000 to around $2,300, $2,400 hundred dollars, which demonstrates that even though we're peddling twice as hard, we're getting, you know, we're getting to the same point. So that's really the challenge with it is the <coughs> tool, and that is dwindling. We're constantly looking for new candidates as new receivables come on. We, we go through that. I talked a little bit earlier about our data warehouse and uh, which is really helping us to identify what is the appropriate collection tool for each receivable. That's helping us to identify more candidates for sequestration, but it's still a very limited pool, and I think that's the real challenge with it. We'll continue to use it, but I think we're gonna to continue to see the receipts from that get smaller, as you know, even as we try to ramp it up. And is it your feeling that um, rather than the 93, did you say that it, earlier that you were closer to around 80? Is that right? Or what? How, what's the amount? We that were you think always, engaged? we were always kind of, you know, not trying to apply a number to that as much as everyone was kind of looking at the pool of our eligible candidates and trying to apply a number to that. I mean, that wasn't really our intent. We were trying to put it together as a comprehensive strategy last year of what we were going to do, and that was a key piece to it, and we think it was very successful, and we're achieving our collection 
number, so we don't tend to try to look at each tool and establish a number for it and and then achieve that number. I mean, we're really happy with $80 million. You know, we're kind of looking at that as one of our, our, our key tools for collection is sequestration for business taxes. It's cal revocation. They're similar. They've had similar track records. Cal revocation um, we use for business tax. And it's the ability to revoke the commercial activity license for businesses that haven't paid. That is going through, that's achieved uh, $100 million, just went over $100 million since we started using it. We're seeing similar, though, in, in both of those tools, we're seeing um, similar situations where the average collection so is I, going down. Yeah. So I understand that you may not see a number. Do you think the school district feels like they also don't see a number for that revenue? I think we, we look at a collection number and overall for each of our taxes. And you that communicated real, that to the school district that they can't count on any kind of number on the Oh no, we, we meet, we have conversations with the school district every month, mm -hmm. um, revenue and finance, and we sit down and go over the revenue projections and where we're at and what we're doing to achieve those numbers. If we're achieving those numbers, great, and what we're doing to get there. Mm -hmm. If there's a shortfall, um, why and what we're trying to do to, uh, to achieve it, and if we have any um, new initiatives coming on, that's part of the discussion each month, uh, a new compliance initiatives. So it's an ongoing conversation every month with the district, and we look at all their, uh, at, at all of the collections. So and just to, I'm kind of, sorry, to emphasize what the commission mm -hmm. thing, what we talk about with them is the overall number, that that's what they care about, whether yes. we're hitting that number. That's right. Yeah. And, and we're being clear with them that we don't have a figure on that overall number. We we're being clear with them that we have an overall number, and then that's what they really focus on with us. Okay. All right. That seems still a little bit unclear and would like just, you know, as we keep going, would love to understand how you're evolving this actual plan, sure. um, or if there is one. <laughs> yeah. um, so just out of curiosity, what is, is there a minimum threshold at which the city wage tax kicks in? There is not. So if you make $1,000, the city wage tax kicks in? It does, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, have, have you evaluated uh, based on, I mean, are, do you have the capacity to take a look at income tax receipts and see, um, you know, the different thresholds and how much is brought in at each income level? I assume you do, right? So, like, someone files a... How would you know, for example, like someone has to file a W-2 or whatever, a, a form um, for the for tax returns, um, and then the city just gleans its wage tax, right, from that, and you would be able to pin it to, like, amount by individual? We do not capture the data by individual. We capture the data by employer. By employer. Okay. Yes. Um, so if you were looking at people who made income levels at, say, like, 20,000 or below, um, would you be able to know how much income is derived, how much city wage tax comes from individuals whose incomes, for example, are, are below $20,000 a year? We have some ability to do that type of analysis. It's with assumptions because we do require, we capture the data at the employer level and then we require employers to send copies of W-2s. We get some of those electronically, some of those paper. Then we go through a process to get that information together. And I think we have information on 80%. About 80% of employers, we have W-2 information, so we don't have 100%, and then we can do some analysis within that. So we do have the ability to do some analysis within our TIP system, the accounting system, the legacy system I was talking about. It's all at the employer level. We actually take those W-2s and basically put it into a database so that we have the ability to analyze some of that data. Interesting. And that's not public information, is it? It is not. Okay. Um, but you can do some level of analysis about how, like, by employer, by employer, but not by household income or not by individual income. Is that right? Correct. That would be a challenge to try to do it by individual. Okay. But you could do rough estimates. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd love to follow up with you on that. I'm interested in, in how much, uh, you know, where, since because there's no minimum threshold on the income tax would just love to be able to f wait on the city wage tax rather would love to follow up sure, with you on that a little that. bit um i'll take a little bit of a you know m 
different interpretation about job losses uh, than my co council colleague here. I do think the 1960s and 1990s did not have to do with the wage tax loss um, about jobs. It had to do with the urbanization and uh, you know a lot of the suburban flight that, that happened during the remaking of American cities. Um, and I would also argue at the same time that while 19106 versus Gwynedd Valley, you know, property value and home value is very different from revenue generation. I still think that we are the economic engine for southeastern Pennsylvania. The amount of revenue that is generated here and then pushes out to the rest of the state far exceeds um, the quote unquote wealth that's housed in private wealth in our suburbs. So I think it's just, you know, a little bit different. I understand that there's like new evolving um, suburban, uh, uh, you know, tracks that are built on, um, you know, King of Prussia malls and other commercial outlets that are, that are starting to change some of that and probably looking at us as more of a regional economy than it is, you know, just a Philadelphia kind of base. But I do think it's important to, to recognize that, um, our city, our city's uh, finances are built largely off wage and income tax as opposed to property tax. Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that we are a major city. Most people do not live here. Um, many people who work here, uh, you know, live in other places, but they take the benefits of a city. They ride our transit, they require our police, they certainly require licenses and inspections. They uh, use our workforce, and so it's a reason behind it. But just for clarity, could you, um, Rob, even though all of us should know this, but just for clarity, can you just divide up, like, percentage-wise, the city's budget, what percent of the budget is based off wage and income tax, and what percent of the budget sure. relies on property? Yeah, so um, the, Give me just a second to. Def um, so I'm Anna Adams, I'm the budget director. So um, in FY20, um, just in terms of the revenues that are, it depends whether you add the PICA portion of the, the wage tax or not. So if you take aside the PICA portion of the wage tax, which we show is coming in from revenue of other, from other governments, but fundamentally it is wage tax. If we didn't include it, it would be, wage would be account for about 45%. When you do add in the portion that comes from, um, that through PICA, it's significantly higher than that. And then property tax is about 20% and business tax is about 13%. And then the other taxes are a little smaller than that. So predominantly, we're very dependent on the wage tax. And that's been always the, the challenge in Philadelphia. Right. And, you know, again, uh, there is a difference about why so much of our income is derived out of wage tax. And that, again, has to do with the fact that we are one of the largest cities uh, in the country. And many people work here but do not live here. And so we have made a conscious decision recognizing that we're not simply going to tax our own residents um, for all the services that people from all over the region and, in fact, a lot of the country actually take advantage of. So um, it is important for us to find a balance, but important for us also to recognize that this idea that we're going to somehow eliminate the wage tax or get down to, you know, something that is almost negligible and somehow find money to replace it in an even way is not actually realistic or possible. Would you, like, do you have some thoughts about that? I think, um, I think, I think you're, we're highly dependent on the wage tax, so any, any adjustments in part of when Rob talked about the cost, so even though those incremental um, they're very incremental, the decrease in the wage tax, it still costs us about $90 million over the five-year plan. So it's, it's not insignificant for us, even though they're relatively small. I think we know also that, we, that every tax commission has looked at the balance of our taxes. And, and um, we've seen during the recession that if we're too dependent on a highly volatile tax, it also causes some um, instability in our taxes. So, so I think trying to get that balance right between kind of more stable taxes like property tax and a more volatile tax like business and wage tax is something that we need to probably strike a better balance than we have. Sure. Um, but yes, we're highly, so any changes that we have to make will have to be done on an incremental right. basis just to make sure that we have stability yeah. in our budget. Another no, complication for us is the uniformity clause. Yeah really requires us to have commercial and residential at the same rate, which gives us less flexibility in how we implement our property tax than in many other states. Yeah. 
And I would argue the same way is true of our, of our wage and income tax. I mean, I don't think it makes That's a right. whole lot of sense for us to have flat taxes across the board. They inevitably benefit the wealthiest people who can afford to pay more, use more services just as much. Um, and so, you know, we are handicapped on a number of different levels um, that puts us in challenging situations, as you said. Clearly, it would make more sense for us to, to charge commercial in a totally different way than residential. And yes. it's one of the reasons why we have created new, um, you know, tried to, tried to be why creative we have, more around it. And, right. you know, for me personally, given that poverty is such a top issue, I'd like to be a little bit more creative about um, if there are other ways that we can look at, at, at other taxes as well. Um, okay, so... Uh, Councilwoman, uh, you might have started another, the debate. Okay, Councilman yep. Dom now has his light on, so... Uh, Councilman Dom? I just want to make a few comments on that. I mean, my suggestion is to look at the 21 incentives and see what those are costing us versus altering the other taxes that are having to create those incentives. And if we're satisfied, by the way, with our status quo right now, we're the top 20 cities in the United States, we're at the lowest in average income, and we're at the highest of poverty, we're at the lowest of entrepreneurship rates, and we're at the second or third lowest, actually, of um, new construction. Everyone talks about it, but we're still at the lowest. Then we should continue on the same path. But if we're not, we need to look at the reasons why other cities are booming a lot greater than our city and have much lower poverty rates. The best way to take people out of poverty is a good job. That is the best way. And we need to create an environment where there are more good paying jobs. And that is, should be our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Gim? And I would just say that jobs are a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator of whether possibilities open up, so that opportunities are created. So good transit, quality schools, um, those kinds of things also have a major factor, and immigration, believe it or not, is a major indicator of whether uh, jobs building, you know, income inequality going down, all of those things, we should be looking at leading indicators. Jobs are always going to be a lagging indicator of whether we have done it because they're the outcome, you know. So, um, so you don't start with jobs. You start with, you start with the things that we know fuel them. And those are always going to be up for debate. That's what this council is going to be about. That's what we're kind of teasing around, uh, not teasing, but, you know, we're, we're pushing around the boundaries of what that looks like. Um, so I had a quick question about the tiered assistance program, um, the TAP program that's been outlined in uh, the rep well, this is for revenue department really as well. But um, you know, I've really appreciated the collaboration between revenue and the water department to provide affordability for low income residents um, who need to keep the water on. So a, a few questions is, um, do you know how many properties the city, did the city seek court, uh, court authorization to sell its share sale due to the unpaid water sewer bills in the last fiscal year and the current fiscal year? So. I'll have to take a look. I had my okay. deputy for water sure. here earlier at the hearing and was anticipating her answer this. Did you say zero residential? Did you? Yeah. Were you? I'm sorry, repeat the, the question. Yeah. I just so we're, I'm trying to find out, you know, how much, how, how, how much access is there to TAP? So how many properties did the city seek court authorization to sell its sheriff's sale? Due oh, to well, unpaid water and sewer bills in the oh, last none. fiscal year, no, none. Okay. No, no, we're not doing and any residential. And then how about in the current fiscal year? None. No. Okay, great. Yeah. No. It was um, an easier question than I. Yeah, yeah. Didn't want. I didn't want. I'm not, I'm, this is not a gotcha question. Is <laughs> yeah. just I, I trying looking, to gain clarity? I was looking for participation rates in TAP, not. Uh, yeah. Um. So. Do, do you know, though, if law department, I know that you don't for revenue, but do you, would you know if the law department did? Like, did would not. you have any indication about that? So they did not. The answer is no. And we did okay. not authorize that. So we have had some either. few yeah, and, and outside council did not either. So there were no residential properties um, for water in uh, Sheriff Sale. Um, great, thank you. And uh, the Water Rate Board's uh, July 2018 order requiring the Water Department to work with the public advocate to help do the uh, forgiveness, uh, arrearage, arrearage, I can't believe that's a word, um, forgiveness program. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about what the water department, where the water department is on working with the public advocate, and uh, are there any proposals that are being made around all of that? From the, your department. The uh, rate board decision, excuse me, Francis Beckley, chief counsel to the revenue department. Yeah. The rate board decision actually ordered the water department to work with the law department and the revenue department in order to examine the legal obstacles to arrearage forgiveness. And that process is being worked on internally as we speak. Okay. Um, and again, did you say that, do, are you planning to make any proposals to the public advocate around? I think that when, the, when we've reached internal agreement as to the right proposal, we'll have informal discussions with the, pu with the public advocate on that. I mean, we worked very closely with them in the design. I personally worked on the UPA proposals for real estate, but members of my team have worked with them, worked with them in designing TAP, and we've always been collaborative with CLS on the assistance programs because obviously it's in our interest to make sure that they work. Sure, exactly. Thank you. Um, and the last question I have is, um, I know you're not the water department, but do you know if they're able to do remote shutoffs of water service for residential customer sales under its new AMI program? Do you have any idea about that? I we can get that to you. I believe when that's implemented, there will that will be available, but not across the board of all AMI. It will be with certain customers, and there's criteria for how those customers are selected. Yeah, we just want to make sure that people are protected and that yes. we're really thoughtful about yeah. all of that. I can get you more information on that for sure. Okay, great. And then uh, last question. Nobody else? Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> uh, so today, uh, you know, around the country, Uber and Lyft drivers are taking to the streets and they're going on strike to, uh, you know, take on the company's unjust labor practices. I know that the city um, has recently announced that it plans to take Uber to court um, to have revenue audit whether Uber owes business income receipts and wage taxes from 2015 to 2017. Is that accurate? What, uh, what was reported in this morning's inquiry is, was correct, that what we did was we filed a motion to compel them to produce documents. Um, their response to the fact that we had made three requests for the documents that would allow us to, to determine whether they had correctly filed and paid their taxes um, was that it had been lost in the mailroom. I don't wow. know if the dog in the mailroom made it, but um, we, before we had a chance to respond to the reporter's inquiry about our court case, we got a call from Uber saying that they're going to provide us with everything that we asked for. So it, it, it does appear that this is an effective way uh, to get corporations' attentions when we haven't been able to get exactly. necessary documents. Right. No, and we plan to continue filing the, that type of action. Yes, and I appreciate that because I do think that we're going to have to let people know that we are both going to audit and um, and that we expect them to fully turn over their financials. And I think like if they can, People will delay. Um, do you have any idea about how much money has been generated from rideshare uh, for our city over time? I mean, we certainly have an estimate through the school district money, right? So would you have any guess about what might be owed to the city through rideshare over that period? I don't. I don't have anything with me today. We can get back to you. Okay. Um, because we're, I mean, Rob, is it true? I mean, we're calculating some level of percentage based on rideshare through the school district of Philadelphia. That's right, the district, okay. yes, that's right. So we have some level of estimated revenue that they're pulling in. We, we may not know like all the income receipts, wage, you know, the finer points of what they might consider exemptions and other things, but we're, we have a ballpark number. Is that we right? do, yes, okay. we'll get you that. All right, and so we would expect, um, we would expect to have those. Um, and can you provide for us, you don't have to do it now, but a list of other audits the Department of Revenue has conducted over the past three years, um, you know, what you do to identify the types of companies that you do audit and any additional revenue that's become, you know, available through the auditing process. In part, you know, we're trying to make it clear that, you know, we, we try yes. to do a lot of protections mm -hmm. for people, but we do need 
to, for people to pay their yeah, taxes. Yeah, so we can supply you with how many audits we've done, the number of uh, the dollars assessed. We should have some collection numbers, and to some degree, we might be able to break that down um, by industry. Sure. And then we'll, you know, we'll do a minimum threshold. You obviously don't have to do it for smaller amounts of money, yeah. but we'd like to know the bigger audits that you've done. And, and but we uh, can't give you any specific sure. names of taxpayers. Of course, right. That's confidential, but Understood. we can give you kind of the criteria. And audits by industry, is that right? By industry and over certain like dollar thresholds, you know, audits of businesses with over a million, over five million, something like that. We could stratify. That's extremely helpful. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Um, thank you all very much. This committee will stay in a recess until five o'clock today when there'll be public testimony. Thank you.